Welcome everyone to uh, an Alliance for Community Trees, uh, another one of our webcasts in the Alliance for Community Trees webcast series. Um, we are getting started. Um, we're making sure all of our presenters are on. Um, so we'll just get started here in another minute or so. Um, feel free to uh, chat or ask questions. Um, throughout the, the broadcast, we'll make sure to answer them. Uh, today's session is a fun and creative tree tool, so you are in the right place. We'll just hold on for another um, couple seconds or so here, and we'll get started. All right, it looks like we are all set. So welcome again um, to the Alliance for Community Trees webcast series. Um, the Alliance for Community Trees webcast series is a monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience two, or in this case, three model organizations, methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour with two presenters, or three in this case, speaking on the same topic for slightly different perspectives. Each presenter uh, will present for about 10 minutes or so, uh, followed by another uh, five minutes or so of questions and answers. This session is being recorded. This is a program of Alliance for Community Trees, the only national nonprofit dedicated to serving grassroots organizations and municipalities that plant and care for trees, where over 90% of Americans live in cities and towns. Starting in June, that's next month, these webcast sessions will continue to be free for current AC Trees members only and cost $55 per participant. So if your organization is not yet a member or hasn't renewed for 2014, be sure to go to actrees.org and click join now to renew or, or join um, and have your membership be up to date. Today's session is fun and creative tree tools. Planting trees is vital to maintaining our urban forests and creating healthy communities. Innovative grassroots organizations have recognized that one way to spice up community greening is to use creative tools that make planting, watering, pruning, and removing invasive plants more fun. AC Trees members have found success encouraging residents to ride watering bikes, use volunteer-made pruning tools, and working with animals, all in the name of growing a health a healthy urban forest. And we are so pleased to have uh, three of our very outstanding member organizations join us today. First up, we have our uh, Philadelphia member, uh, UC Green. We have uh, Joe Shapiro, who is a longtime uh, volunteer with UC Green presenting um, and Suma Queen, who works at UC Green, will be assisting the presentation. We're so excited to have them with us. And just to let you know a little bit about Joe, he's a lifelong resident of University City, which is a neighborhood in Philadelphia. He is um, has been a volunteer with the Philadelphia Water Department and has helped maintain the grounds at Philadelphia's legendary Fairmount Park. He is a member of the Larsage Tree Tenders Group, the University City Garden Club, and Friends of Clark Park. In his free time, Joe likes to uh, perform woodworking activities, listen to classical music, collect minerals, 
and of course, garden in the urban area. And Joe joins us now. Welcome. Thank you. Um, prior to retiring, I became a tree tender over 15 years ago. And I was trained by Mindy Maslin at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. And twice a year, we'd have plantings, one in the fall and one in the, the, uh, the spring. And what I'll be discussing is a handle that I've devised used to wrestle old and burlapped trees um, into the tree pit. And when I talk about old and burlap trees, they'll also be referred to as a B and B tree. So the tool that I've devised is only for B and B trees that were uh, provided in wire baskets. It won't work on a B and B tree if it's just been bald and burlap and tied with rope. So I'll tell you about how my handle evolved. Um, normally with um, Normally, you have a wire basket that has wire loops around the rim of the basket. And um, you have to grab those with your hands. Uh, they're hard on your hands. You can only grip one loop with one hand. And you really have to bend over and stoop when you lower the tree into the tree pit. So the way I got this idea was, at one time, we had some smaller trees delivered to us in wire baskets. And the nursery had actually given us handles to work with the wire basket. And the handles they gave us were made out of plastic. And they had a, basically a figure eight shape. And the way it worked for us is you would slide this plastic handle through the wire loop on the, on the uh, tree basket, fold it back on itself to a double thickness, and then you had a, a, a loop to place your hand. Well, these had deficiencies too. The grip was only good for one hand. It was also short and you had to stoop over. And with time, uh, they didn't hold up very well. And so what I came up with was something a little more sophisticated, which was a wood dowel and a loop of plastic, of, uh, excuse me, polypropylene plastic rope. Uh, my handle is comfortable in hands. Because it has a longer dowel, you can put two hands on the, on the handle and get a good secure grip. And because of the length of the rope, which attaches through the loop of the, of the wire basket, um, you can lift with keeping your back straight and lifting with your legs. Uh, by the way, I didn't name this after myself. Uh, Mindy Maslin at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society named it after me. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about now is how we actually make these handles. Okay, so in the upper left-hand corner, I'm starting with a hardwood dowel, cut the length of nine inches. And the way I sort of pick nine inches is when you buy a dowel, it usually comes 36 inches long. And so this way you can get four handles out of it. And then I use a piece of 5 16 diameter hollow braid polypropylene rope. You can use virtually any kind of rope that you choose. Um, I picked this one being plastic, it's less apt to uh, get moldy when uh, things get stored away. The other thing that I'll use, and you'll see in a minute, is a short length of PVC clear plastic tubing. Uh, and the first step is making loops on each end of the piece of rope. And the way I'm making the loops is tying a bowline or bowline knot around the dowel. And it's tied around the dowel uh, snug, but not so snug as it can't be easily slid off the dowel. And so in the upper right hand corner, I show the four steps in tying the knot. And this is a knot I learned back when I was a Boy Scout. And one of the ways we were taught was in step one, you make a rabbit hole. In step two, the rabbit comes out of the hole and goes around the tree. And in step three, the rabbit goes back down the hole. And then step four, you have your knot. And so it produces a, a loop that won't slip. And then what I'll do is take some electrical tape and tie the loose end snug 
with um, the basic length of the uh, the rope to make a little make it more finished at the end. The next thing I'm doing is um, having only tied a loop on one end is to hook the rope and pull it through a length of this plastic tubing. And so this is going to prevent chafing in the long run where the rope slides underneath the wire basket handle. And then I'll finish by tying a bowline on the opposite end of the rope length. And so you can see at the bottom of this slide that when tensioned, you have about 10 inches in length from the handle down to the point where it would hook onto the, the root ball basket. Uh, I'm not that tall. I like 10 inches. If you're taller and you have a lot of tall people, you can certainly make it longer. It's something that you can adjust to suit. The other thing is uh, it doesn't have to be this sophisticated. If you have broken rakes and shovels, their handles make wonderful dowels and you can come up with your own version of this root ball handle. Next. So now when it comes time to use the handles, typically the wire baskets have five looped handles. And so you'll need five of the Shapiro root ball handles to lift the tree. You insert the rope through Remove one loop from the handle, insert it through the wire loop on the basket, insert it back on the handle, and pull the two loops towards the center of the handle, and you're all set. Here we are working on um, a, a, a job. We're going. We've been planting some bald and burlap trees, and we're all volunteers. And uh, in the next slide. that up here in a minute. Oh, so in the next slide, here we are. On the left, we're moving the tree. There's five of us. We have pretty good control, um, and we can lower it into the pit. So the first use for the handles is moving the tree. The second use is lowering it into the pit. The third use sometimes is removing the tree from the pit. Sometimes this happens where we put the tree and we go, uh-oh, we're too deep. Uh, sometimes it's hard to judge where uh, the root flare at the top of the root ball is in relation to the curb and the sidewalk. And so we now have the option of lifting the tree out of the pit and adjusting the depth of the pit. If we didn't have these root ball handles, it would have been a lot harder to get a tree out of the pit. The other thing that can be done is that once the tree is in the pit, we'll flip to the next slide. Once the tree is in the pit, we look at the orientation of the branches, and these are city trees, they're going in curbside, and we want to make sure that the longest of the branches run parallel to the street rather than perpendicular. We don't want to get these trees hit by any large trucks. And so with the root ball handles attached, it's possible to take two handles and pull in a tangential direction and rotate the root ball and line up the tree as best we think for uh, avoiding growth towards the street. The other thing that we'll use the handles for is sometimes when the tree goes into the pit, the bottom of the root ball might not be flat or angled and the tree is leaning. And so we can just use one handle at a time to lift the tree and shim it to get the trunk perpendicular by putting some soil or sometimes a small rock under the edge of the root ball and then we're ready to backfill the hole. So we're at the point now on the left the tree's going in and on the right it's situated and ready for backfilling. This one? Yeah, okay. So this concludes my part of the presentation, and I guess I'll return control back to Sarah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joe, for uh, that wonderful presentation. If you have questions for Joe, please go ahead and type them in the questions box. 
we are uh, getting some uh, questions in now. Before we get those, those, all of those questions in, just wanted to ask you, Joe, um, I know that you addressed um, other kinds of uh, root ball handles that you kind of got the idea for creating the Shapiro from. Um, what was kind of the point where you were able to, to, to get the design down? Um, how, how long ago did you, how long did it take you to, to kind of figure that out? Well, it was shortly after I had the plastic handles. Uh, we used them for smaller trees. The next time we used them for larger trees and they weren't working, it was tearing. So it was that point that I was inspired to, to come up with something better. Uh, the other thing I neglected to mention is that on the UC Green website, which is ucgreen.org, under our resources and how-to handouts uh, boxes, you can find the PDF of the complete instructions for making these uh, handles. Excellent, wonderful. That I'm sure that many of our members will see that this is a really valuable tool to use, especially uh, for safety considerations. Uh, root balls can be really heavy, so that's excellent. We had a, another question come in. What is the largest caliper tree you've, you've moved uh, using uh, the Shapiro? So the, I don't know that the caliper size would apply. We had a moldy stemmed, uh, I think, magnolia we planted in the park. And uh, we think the root ball was maybe over 400 pounds. Uh, it didn't really get lifted. It just got dragged. But without the handles, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Sure, sure. Has this um, made, this can be for you um, or Sue, uh, do you think that this has made a difference in uh, the volunteers that come out? Do they, do, do people see you on the street using this, um, this tool and think, you know, maybe that they can also help to plant trees and um, help to maneuver it? I'm, I'm not sure if it has had any effect on your volunteer audience. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Once people see what a Shapiro can do, they realize that they too can be almost invincible when it comes to planting a huge bald and burlap tree. Excellent. It's very inspirational. And I know that uh, this is a, a great tutorial. Again, if you have more, um, if you're curious uh, about the Shapiro, we have some time for questions at the end as well. And you can check out uh, UC Green's website, ucgreen.org. Wonderful. So our next presentation actually comes out of Indianapolis um, with Keep Indianapolis Beautiful. Uh, Nate Ferris is Director of Community Forestry at KIB. And he has, uh, since joining KIB, he's worked with communities um, in Indianapolis to plant thousands of trees. Um, Nate is actually the very first arborist in Indiana to achieve both of arboriculture's highest distinctions. He's both a registered consulting arborist and a board certified master arborist. Nate is often um, in the neighborhoods in, in Indianapolis, uh, giving tree planting demonstrations, um, in the tree yard, loading trees on the trailers, um, or in the office, um, making sure that plans for plantings are coming out well and uh, getting creative with the other KIB staff. And he has a presentation about some really neat watering trailers. We're excited to learn more about them. Nate, you can take it away. All right. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, crystal clear. Oh, okay, thanks. All right, so um, I started at Keep Indianapolis Beautiful in 2005, and by uh, we, we were planting about 500 trees a year at that point, and we realized that we needed to uh, start watering some of these trees that were planted in highly public spaces where people hadn't asked for them. Uh, but they still needed establishment watering. So we created a youth tree team program and we hire high schoolers in, uh, started out only in the summer. Now we hire them in the spring, summer, and fall to uh, 
water trees weekly. And uh, we realized we needed some sort of setup that would allow us to move people, these, these uh, high schoolers, we needed to move them from site to site. And we also needed to be able to move water and we also didn't want to be uh, burning gasoline and having a loud motor running while we did it. So, uh, let's see if I can get this to advance. Do I have the control of the mouse here? There we go. Uh, so, this is the entire setup that we came up with. We have a 15 passenger van and we have a horse trailer with a watering tank inside and I'll go through some of the details. Uh, we started out with one of these setups. We now have uh, four vans and four watering trailers and we now employ about uh, 80 high schoolers in the spring, summer, and fall to take care of trees. Okay, so um, I'll just spend a second here looking at the van. This is the first van we ever bought. We bought a regular 15-passenger van, and we actually um, installed a uh, aftermarket dual rear wheel system. We didn't have to buy a new axle. Uh, this allowed for stability. There were a lot of uh, concerns at the time about 15-passenger vans rolling over, and we wanted a little more stability. Um, since then, uh, we've uh, have more vans, and the vans now have computer chips that uh, do all the work to prevent rollovers, and uh, we actually don't need dual rear wheels anymore. So, um, I guess we'll start off with uh, where we get the water. We use uh, city fire hydrants, and actually teenagers love opening up and using a fire hydrant. Uh, of course, we teach them in safety, but uh, I think there's just something really cool about uh, using this part of a city's infrastructure. Uh, not too many high schoolers ever open up a fire hydrant legally. Uh, here we have a high schooler using a hydrant wrench. Uh, we, have, we have to meter the water, so there is a um, water meter, and uh, then we use a fire hose to get the water to the trailer. So here's a close-up of some of the parts. This is the water meter that tracks how much we use. Um, we uh, used to get the water donated by the private utility managing the water. Uh, now we have a, a public charitable trust and we have to pay for the water. Uh, so that's been an increased cost recently. Uh, we have a hydrant wrench to open up the fire hydrant. And then you can see in this picture we have the fire hose that attaches to a spigot. Um, and this will take water in above the tank and drop it into the tank, which we'll show you here in just a minute. I also want to point out that we've added some safety lighting on here. Uh, a lot of the times we're watering in uh, lower traffic areas like neighborhoods, neighborhood streets. But if we're on uh, busier thoroughfares, uh, they do put on uh, safety vests. They also turn on the directional safety lighting. And you can see here we have the, the spigots uh, where the water comes out of the back. Okay, I think we have a video now. I'm going to see if it plays. Uh, let's give it a go here. And uh, there's some vocal stylings from one of the youth as they were taking the video, so you should enjoy that. Let's see. It doesn't appear to be doing anything yet. So, Nate, I think we're going to just... Go ahead and play those videos from my desktop, if that's all right. That's great. I would prefer that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you can see the water is coming in the top here. The video is a little grainy. I don't think we're getting the audio. That's okay. Um, it's a 500-gallon watering tank. And uh, it comes out the back into those spigots. Boy, it's kind of jumpy. It was a lot smoother. <laughs> so uh, sorry for the quality of this video. Uh, but we do have the water going into the watering buckets uh, from the bottom of the tank. So the great thing about this particular system is it's gravity fed. We don't have a motor pumping it. Um, gravity is pushing the water out of the tank into the watering buckets. And this video is just about over, which will be good so we can keep moving on. All right. Excellent. So I'm going to try to go to the next slide here. 
great. Uh, here's another still shot of what it is, the 500 gallon watering tank uh, and four spigots on the back. We can fill up four buckets at the same time. It only takes about 20 seconds to fill up a bucket. And, uh, and then the youth can carry it to the trees from there. I got a few pictures of that coming up. There's another thing. We just have uh, ball valves so we can turn off the water, turn on the water. Uh, there's another, oh, this is another video. I think uh, I'm going to try and skip this video since I know what happens when I try it, but it's just really water coming out of the back. So uh, the youth do get a little break. Uh, so as they're filling up their buckets, they can uh, just take a little break. The, let's see if we get to, ah, so here's the youth. They each uh, are carrying two five-gallon buckets full of water. Five gallons weighs 40 pounds, so they have, uh, we have high schoolers with 40 pounds in each hand walking several hundred feet to trees. Um, and we'll get to some of the stats about how many trees they're watering uh, each day here in just a minute. So each tree is getting about 10 gallons. We're planting uh, mostly one inch caliper trees and they're getting 10 gallons of water per week unless we've received more than one inch of rain. Here uh, you can see the beautiful uh, main order root, the root flare there and some mulch in there pouring on the water. We water these trees uh, for the first three years actually for establishment. I wanted to give you a sense of uh, what this cost us, buying a, a new horse trailer and uh, the tank and all the drainage and filling parts, all the uh, traffic control lights, all that stuff uh, comes out to about $8,500. Uh, so uh, one crew consists of two adults and eight high schoolers. I have eight youth here. And uh, in the summer, that one crew of 10 people generally waters about 600 trees in 15 hours. They work, uh, they water trees three days a week, uh, five hours each day. So that's uh, 600 trees in 15 hours. And uh, let's see, in the summer, they're working Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesdays to water. On Thursdays, we do enrichment activities with them, uh, financial literacy, uh, introducing them to different aspects of nature. And in the spring and fall, we also use them to continue watering. They work an eight-hour day on Saturdays in the spring and fall. Uh, they can't water quite as many trees in eight hours as they could in 15, so we pay private contractors to supplement uh, the watering to the trees that we can't reach on those days. We currently have four vans and four trailers. Um, so in the summer, we have eight crews. We have a morning crew and an afternoon crew that uh, share a van and a trailer. Uh, that allows us to, to hire about 80 people. And uh, let's see, anything else on here? OK, it looks like we have reached the end. And uh, I hope you all enjoy the idea of the watering trailer. Thank you so much, Nate. What a what a fun activity. <laughs> and, you know, it just looks like the youth are having a blast um, out there. And, and sometimes in the summer heat, uh, there's nothing more fun than working with water. So. Exactly. And we, we've been really successful. I think there's a lot of funding out there for youth employment uh, in the environment. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, feel free to chat in the questions box if you have questions for Nate. Um, just to, to get us started, um, was your, how did you, um, get started with this, uh, you know, retrofitted, uh, horse trailer? Did you, what, did you have one donated? Did you purchase one outright? Um, and did it have a tank in it already? How did, how did you guys get started? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I looked around on, uh, you know, the internet, like, has this problem already been solved? And, um, you know, all I could find were uh, tanks that were kind of permanently affixed to a trailer and already had a motor, which is not what I was looking for, um, or just tanks themselves and you had to do the rest. So I thought, okay, I'll buy a tank and I'll do the rest. I need to find a, a trailer that can carry uh, 500 gallons of water. Uh, has the capacity to do that and can also be made so that there can be multiple spigots with water coming out the back. So I actually, our first trailer was not bought new. I bought it used and um, man, I learned a lot about buying uh, trailers then. I kind of bought a junker and uh, we probably spent as much fixing it up and making it like new as buying a new one. 
Uh, so since then, we've been buying new ones. Uh, but we still have our original, the first trailer that I bought. Uh, and we, we've named our trailers. Our uh, original trailer is called Donkey. And uh, it keeps kicking. Excellent. We have some more questions coming in. Um, have you tried using um, a wagon to move the buckets from tree to tree as opposed to having the youth carry them? Um, and, you know, is there... Is there any you know risk of injury or anything um, or, or stress um, on the youth from carrying the heavy 40 pound buckets in each hand? Sure, uh, th that's a really good question. Um, no, we we haven't carried additional equipment to wheel the water, uh, mostly because there's uh, we're already carrying a lot of gear. We actually also carry gear for staking trees if they're leaning. Um, and uh, sometimes we carry some mulch to remulch trees. So, you know, there's not a lot of whole, a whole lot of space to carry around extra wheeled equipment. Um, you know, and part of my reason uh, for uh, creating the program the way I did is to uh, promote physical activity. A lot of youth aren't doing anything outside, uh, outside or uh, physically challenging. And uh, this, this does that. And uh, we do try to... Um, do all we can to prevent injuries. We start every day with uh, stretching, uh, especially in the parts of the body that we're using when we're carrying those buckets. Um, you know, and we've, we've been running this program since uh, 2006. That's about eight years. I've never, there's been no uh, reported injuries uh, of, uh, you know, any, any shoulder or back or, or anything like that. So it seems like the youth are capable of uh, this level of work. Uh, we do, we've, we've had, uh, we always hire, uh, by choice, we generally hire more uh, women, young women than young men. Um, and uh, for both both genders, it's a big confidence booster to uh, be able to carry uh, this amount of water and, and do this kind of work. And uh, we, we, we've had some 100-pound uh, students who've uh, been able to carry 80 pounds of water, which is impressive. So uh, wow. that's kind of how we've gone about it. That sounds like quite a regimen, especially during the summer, you know, three days a week carrying these buckets. It just, it sounds like uh, they're getting, getting strong, getting buff. And that's what we like in our youth. Is, uh, is they enjoy sure that. that yes. strong. <laughs> Another question. Um, do you limit your new plantings to uh, the capacity of the youth tree team um, that, that they have to water? Um, do you, you know, factor in your, your new plantings, you know, all the watering it's going to take for the plantings? Yeah, we, we sure do. Um, and um, in a lot of cases, if we're planting with a neighborhood and they've uh, asked for the trees, uh, then, then we ask them to do this watering and they sign a watering commitment. Um, but in, in some places, uh, we have some, some funding um, and not enough requests from people to plant trees in their neighborhoods, so we proactively plant some of the highly public streets. And uh, in that case, yeah, we do limit ourselves to what we can actually keep up with on the watering, what we have capacity for. And uh, between our youth tree team and our contractors, that, that is kind of a limiting factor on how many trees we can plant. It doesn't make sense for us to throw trees in the ground uh, if they're going to die in, in, the, in the drought in a few months. Right. And uh, generally, we, we pay uh, our cost for trees is about $100 a tree, and um, the youth tree team, we figure it costs us a, about $100 a year to uh, water a tree with also, the youth tree can, team program. Can you, can you attach a short hose to the, to the spigots coming out of the uh, trailer? Uh, we have not done that. I don't know how fast they would flow. Um, one of our other employees here uh, rigged up a, a solar panel that works uh, an electric, tiny electric pump um, that you could, that we've hooked a hose up to and you could put a sprinkler head on and you could water perennials that way. Um, that's, that's the only kind of adjustment we've done, but no, we haven't done trickling out of a hose. We're trying, for us, we're trying to be more efficient and, and get the buckets filled quickly, get them to the trees, keep going to the next tree. I think, uh, water trailing out of a hose might take a little longer than we're willing to wait. Also, do you use gator bags? Um, yeah. Uh, dump, when you're using buckets, uh, gator bags don't really make sense. So no, we right. do not use gator bags. And last question. Uh, what hourly rate um, do you uh, compensate the tree team, if you're comfortable answering? 
Oh no, that's a great question. Um, we've always tried to pay them um, more than minimum wage. Um, I have since um, hired someone else to full, to run this program uh, that I started. Um, so I'm actually not familiar with the current rate. Uh, I remember when the uh, minimum wage was around five and a half dollars. We were paying seven twenty-five an hour. So, and um, I think you uh, leaders start at eleven dollars an hour, and then. Um, if they've worked for us for more than one year, we give them a raise as well uh, for people who've worked more than one year. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nate. Uh, this is really awesome information and a great way to get youth engaged um, and outside and active um, and involved with their, their local canopy. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Our next uh, presentation, if you have more questions, uh, just keep typing them in the questions box. We will have some extra time um, at the end of the uh, session uh, to answer those. Our next presenter comes out of Trees Atlanta, and this is a unique tree tool um, as it uh, involves animals, which is pretty exciting. Um, Brian Williams is a forest record restoration coordinator at Trees Atlanta, and he's been with the organization for the past five years. Brian has managed projects um, including the Invasive Grazing Program, Piedmont Prairie Restoration, Riparian Restoration, Seedling Planting, Urban Tree Planting, and of course conventional uh, invasive plant removal. Brian is an ISA certified arborist, and he also holds licenses in pesticide application and erosion control. So he's very familiar with uh, urban forest ecosystems, and uh, we are so happy to have Brian join us now. I'll take it away, Brian. Well, thank you. Um, every, everybody loves this program because everybody loves animals. So uh, that just just on the surface, it's a great uh, PR generator and. Uh, I'll explain just how we use it to that effect and kind of the, the nuts and bolts of uh, what goes into the program. So on our on our title page here, this is actually a picture of the uh, sheep when they're at work, and this was in a local park in southwest Atlanta called uh, Perkerson Park, which is kind of in a lower income area, and we did a big education push down here and uh, kind of got everybody local used to the idea that there are going to be animals back here. And, and the funny thing behind it was this was originally farmland to begin with uh, 100, 150 years ago. So in a lot of instances, we're bringing these animals back to areas where they've been absent for quite some time. Um, so we're we're looking at, Trees Atlanta is looking at uh, the, the sheep grazing program kind of as an alternative to to conventional invasive removal, which typically um, with the invasives we're dealing with in the city, it, it's very chemical dependent. When, when in the southeast we're dealing with things like kudzu and now Japanese hops, uh, Chinese privet, th these are all things that typically you can't pull them out and expect them to go away unless you're there every week, you know, almost seven days a week, pulling every single seedling you find. So most of these instances you'll have a five acre field of kudzu and, and you know usually we'll have to spray it so the great thing about bringing the animals in is that you can uh, reduce greatly reduce the amount of, of vegetative mass that's present in these areas and you know you could have tons and tons of leaf mass in that one acre area and if you're going to go through and just spray that outright that's a lot of chemical you're using but if you graze the area first and and you can reduce that leaf mass by 90 to 95 percent and then you know you'll graze it again and then you'll come back on top of that ultimately and have to spray whichever little stragglers you have but you, you seriously reduce the amount of chemicals you have to use and at the same time you create an educational opportunity so I'm gonna move forward here um, and kind of go over the equipment basics of, of what we do and we have used two different um, contractors to run this program because we don't have the animal husbandry expertise in-house. Uh, so the first was a contractor out of Tennessee, and that proved to be a little too much distance between Tennessee and Atlanta when there were problems with animals escaping or fencing not working right. So um, we were actually fortunate enough to work with a local contractor for the last two years 
um, who we found because he was a, a friend of, of one of our employees. And uh, that's worked much better because he's on site. He can come out every day to check on the animals and we get a lot more flexibility with that arrangement. So what this contractor provides for us is, you can see in this um, first picture, so there's the sheep. I call it the, the four S's. There's, there's four components. So the animals, we mostly have used sheep. In the beginning, we had a small component of goats in there because the goats can browse a little higher, maybe get a little more ivy off of tree trunks. But goats turn out to be a little too, too clever, and they got into trouble. And goats are also a little noisier. So the second year, we mostly went with uh, sheep. Um, our second component here, we've got a solar-powered fence. Uh, the contractor provides the fencing and sets up the fencing, and it's a movable temporary electric fencing. It's uh, a flexible plastic material, and it rolls up when it's being transported. So basically, it's rolled out, staked into the ground, and then there is a portable solar panel that you can see there in the upper right that is uh, hooked up to a grounding stake, and then um, attached to the fence and it is a uh, it's, it's an alternating current it, it's not a direct current so it's not going to you know everybody's horror story of you know getting shocked by the electrical outlet where you can't let go that doesn't happen I've shocked myself on the fence several times more times than I'd care to remember and it's just a quick little pop and it does hurt a little bit it's enough to keep uh, stray dogs out coyotes those are the, those are the main threats and then You've maybe got people who are just up to no good or kids who are trying to steal a goat for a high school prank, which has happened as well. Um, our third component, we put up signage. You have to put up signage because it is an electric fence. And then we always have the phone number. And, and again, our contractor offered to put his phone number up there instead of ours because we get a lot of phone calls, whether it's support or whether it's people who don't know what's going on or they want to tell us that the dog is barking and won't stop barking. But um, it's always good to have a contact number. And then the fourth component here are the shepherd dogs. And there's two types of dogs. And again, this is where having um, a shepherd with a lot of knowledge about animals comes into play, because the dogs have to be trained to do what they do. And so there's two kinds of dogs that work with the sheep. There are the dogs that move them around. And then there are the dogs that guard them. And in this picture, you're seeing the, the two. They're uh, Anatolian shepherds from Turkey. And those are the two dogs that live with the sheep. They're there 24 hours a day. They think they're sheep. They're raised with the sheep. And it's their job to bark loudly and ferociously at any dogs or coyotes that get too close to the sheep. And I didn't include a picture of the, uh, the border collie at work, but there's um, a separate group of dogs that the shepherd will bring in when it's time to move the sheep within the site, if we're reconfiguring the fence, or to get them from the trailer um, onto the site, just keep them in line. Move to the next slide here. Um, so this is typically the kind of space we bring them to. This is a before picture, and this is at a local nature preserve right on the trail. You can actually see the trail marker there. And um, for anybody who doesn't have to deal with kudzu, you, you've may not know this, but this is, you know, this is, kudzu can grow up this high in, in the space of two weeks to four weeks. Uh, and this area is completely covered. We've got the kudzu's the large broadleaf vine. Japanese hops will be mixed in there. There's microstegium, which is another grassy invasive. And then shooting out of everything, we have giant ragweed, which is native, but it's just a, a pest that grows in with everything else, and it's not something that we're really concerned about the sheep eating and causing collateral damage to. So that same space, after the sheep have come through, oh, there we go, there it's moving, will look like this. And um, depending on how long we leave the sheep there, uh, typically we figure it takes about one week for them to eat one acre of a, of a soft-leaved invasive like kudzu. And, you know, they will eat every bit of vegetable matter there if you leave them long enough. And we actually would have left them a little bit longer here so that they'd start to break the ragweed stalks and eat the leaves off of them. Um, they completely pull up the, the microstegium, the grass, and that won't come back because it's an annual. And then the kudzu you can see here is just reduced to more of the woody vines 
and the same with the, the ragweed. So you're, you're kind of left, depending on how long you let them graze in the space, and we have to be very careful not to overgraze sensitive spaces. So those might include spaces with native tree seedlings or even larger native trees because when the animals start to get hungry, they will start eating other food sources that are a little harder to get to, but they'll try to bend over a tree to eat the leaves. Um, if they're on a hill, we have to really be very sensitive because we don't want to cause erosion. And sometimes we'll go in behind them with a, a revegetation solution just to to avoid that. Um, but with the fence being movable and temporary, we just move them out of an area before it gets too bad. And then when the invasives flush back out again, we'll bring them back to that area later in the year. Let's see, I'm going to move to the next slide here. So here's a side by side comparison where the fence line runs. And you can see the Japanese hops and kudzu on the left side. Compared, that was the thickness before we grazed it. And on the right side, that's afterwards and you know it, it may reflush again that year depending on how early in the summer we grazed it. The key thing when we're going after hops is we're trying to eat all the vegetable matter off before it can set seed. It's an annual and it'll set a lot of seed in any given year so even if you don't completely kill it if it's an annual and you reduce it from producing seed you've really reduced your load for the next year of what you're going to have to deal with in that same space and we do go back year after year to the same spaces to, to continue the treatment. And typically that's two or three visits a year per site, followed by, you know, the, the following year, the third year, some type of chemical spot treatment to get the last of the kudzu root crowns or, you know, if it's privet or something, we'll, we'll treat the stems. Um, we found that it's most effective on large-leaved herbaceous invasives. So for us in the southeast, that's kudzu, English ivy, Japanese hops. Woody invasives, they're, they're just not going to reduce as much. Um, they either can't reach them or, you know, they don't like to eat them. And then there's some things preferentially that they just don't like the taste of. So when we're dealing with things like Mahonia or Holly with a really spiny leaf, they don't even eat much of that. Um, so you have to tailor the, the treatment to the site. So I just prioritize sites that are full of kudzu and, you know, Maybe it's near a stream and we don't really want to go chemical heavy there or it's in an area where there's a lot of kids or the, you know, if it's a, an area that's got a, a local advocacy group, a park, and they don't want to do chemicals, you know, we've offered this as an alternative. Um, and I think my last slide here. Uh, so some of our concerns that that, that we've dealt with, that we've had to come up with answers to. So sometimes people ask about the, the animal waste or nitrification to surface water. And so we, we crunched the numbers on this and figured out how long it takes them to, you know, produce a ton of, of animal manure. And, you know, over the course of a week, the amount of manure that when we run uh, 100 animals in a space, it's, it's equal to if uh, – seven or eight people on, on the street bordering the park decided to fertilize their lawns that week, the amount of, of nitrogen they're adding in. And, and then we're talking little, small postage stamp city lawns, so 100 foot by 100 foot. So, you know, it, it's not that large of a, of a nitrogen load. Um, you can see this picture on the right here, erosion or overgrazing concerns. Here's a erosion gully on an embankment that was existing before we even brought the animals in. And when we see something like this, we either fence the animals off so they don't get to that area to, to disturb that soil, or this particular park, uh, Candler Park, we uh, came back in at the tail end when the animals were there and put out a native grass and straw, and the action of the little hooves walking over the seed actually helps to embed it in the soil, and then you've got a, a cover crop coming up once they're done and once the ground is cleared. Um, we've had concerns about collateral damage to natives, in which case I either tell people maybe this isn't a good site for sheep because you've got too many high-value natives, or um, here we've erected a little chicken wire cage around some 15-gallon trees we had actually planted at a site, and then they're starting to be overtaken by hops. So we fenced off all two dozen trees in that spot to keep the, the animals from knocking them over. And then the, the fourth concern has been noise. We just deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. It's usually the dogs barking, in which case we'll 
move them maybe a little farther from any residential areas. Um, but there, there are some really great pros to the program. Um, the educational aspect, we, we do a Meet the Sheep event at every park space we go to. And uh, it's kind of a educate the community on what we're doing, you know, tell them, you know, don't touch the fence, the dogs will be out here. And, and then we do some um, Meet the Sheep events at schools. And so this was at a Cascade Elementary in West Atlanta. And, you know, a lot of these kids have never been to a farm and they had lots of questions about being a farmer and what the animals do and all kinds of animal related questions. And then kids also love to see the border collie here in the middle at work. Um, so it's just a good outreach and educational opportunity. And then we also do a adopt a sheep program where people can, you know, sort of adopt a particular sheep and get their photo with it. And that usually involves maybe a, a, a small donation to help fund the program. So I think that's the last slide there. Um, and I've got a figure here for, oops, let me go back a slide, for how much herbicide, um, if I can get it to go back how much herbicide typically we're reducing in any given space. Well, I don't think I'm going to get it to go back, but um, it's it's roughly 100 gallons of herbicide per acre, um, and that's figured over, you know, if you're doing three foliar applications over an acre space, and it's probably about 30 gallons over that acre each time, you know, you're, you're reducing by replacing each application with a, a grazing rotation instead, and then you maybe go in there at the end and use 10 gallons. So, you know, you can get some great reductions in chemical use. So I think that's everything. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. We have many, many questions for you. Um, the, f the first of which um, is, did you have to work around any anti-goat or anti-animal ordinances um, around, you know, using goats on public land um, or on so, private land? City of Atlanta doesn't have an explicit ordinance about that. Some of these smaller suburban cities around us do, and our shepherd has had issues working in, in some of those places. But usually, you know, we work very closely with municipal government, and we explain what it is we're doing ahead of time. And typically, we're given a pass. And within City of Atlanta, and within city of Decatur, which is a small city to the east of here that we also work in. You know, both times we've worked with Parks Department and the city manager, and it, it hasn't been a problem. Um, every now and then somebody will call animal control because they think one of the animals is sick, and animal control comes out, and the shepherd comes out, and, you know, they, they have a, a little discussion, and um, so far, no problems. Great. Do you make any um, attempt to, you know, you were talking about the um, nitrogen um, comparison and to fertilizer um, when the sheep when the sheep are done grazing um, an area. Do you have any concern about the kudzu or other invasive species, um, you know, surviving and and getting that good fertilizer from the sheep and uh, not kind of really. reseeding? Okay. These are things that will grow in the most nutrient poor soil. I mean, kudzu is a legume, so it's fixing its own nitrogen on its own. I haven't really seen any like localized bursts based on where the the sheep have been congregating and you know eliminating their waste. So I I don't really think it's that readily available. It breaks down pretty quickly. Um, We've had a few concerns with maybe the sheep moving seeds from site to site, but they have four stomachs and they're breaking down most of the seeds uh, when they digest them. Great. Also, uh, another question, um, when you uh, go to a site, you, know, you, you mentioned having the sheep graze several times before uh, taking kind of the final action with chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, have you gone back to any uh, chemically treated sites and had any concern about the sheep regrazing the, in the following year? Not really. Most of what we are using chemically wise, we, we 
as an institution, we, we go with the safest, least persistent. So, you know, 95% of the time we're either using a, a glyphosate herbicide or um, a triclopyr broadleaf herbicide on, on things like kudzu and hops. And uh, those are not very soil persistent. They break down pretty quickly in, in the, uh, the vegetable matter. So if, if we were using something like a transline on kudzu, which is actually a restricted use herbicide, that one stays in the soil for a while. And you know maybe you could see it coming back out in, in new vegetation. But the, the other issue is the lifespan of a, of a sheep is so short that we haven't really noticed, or the shepherd hasn't noticed, that they're accumulating any kind of harmful effects within, you know, they might live four years. They just sure. typically don't accumulate enough herbicide residue in their body in those four years to, to give them cancer or what have you. Wonderful. Well, this has been such an excellent, excellent uh, presentation, just learning so much about how animals can help us keep a healthy urban forest as well. Thank you so much for your presentation, Brian. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and thank all of our presenters, um, Joe, Nate, and Brian, um, for being part of the AC Truth webcast series and showing, showing us how we can harness the power of the innovative tools uh, to create new fun ways to improve the health of our urban forests. This recorded session um, and resource list will be available uh, later on this month. And if you could take a few minutes to complete the brief survey that pops up at the close of the session, uh, that would be really helpful for us to, to keep uh, maintaining um, the, the great webcast that um, we will provide for our members. Thanks again to presenters and all attendees for um, attending this, another Alliance for Community Trees webcast. And we look forward to seeing you next month on our next webcast session, which will be about creative ways to use urban forest master plans, um, strategic methods of how to use those plans um, for your work. And that concludes the webcast. Thanks everyone so much for participating and we hope you have a great rest of the month. Take care.